Welcome back to Vegas. Lisa Martin and Dave Vellante here with theCUBE live on the Venetian Expo Hall floor talking all things AWS reInvent 2022. This is the first full day of coverage. It is jam packed here. People are back. They are ready to hear all of the new innovations from AWS. Dave, how does it feel to be back yet again in Vegas? Yeah, you know, Vegas, yeah, I think it's my 10th time in Vegas this year, so whatever. This That's year fine. alone? You know. But. You must have a favorite steak <laughs> restaurant then. There's several in Vegas. Actually, the, the, the restaurants in Vegas are actually really good. You know? They are good. They used to be terrible. But, 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 but I'll tell you, my, my favorite, mm, the place that closed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, closed. In between where we are in the, in the win oh. and, and the Venetian. Anyway. Was it cut? No, I forget what Something the name else. of it was. Okay. It was like a Greek sort of steak place. Anyway. Now I'm hungry. We were at Pure Accelerate a couple years ago. Yes, we were. When they announced Cloud Block Store. That's right. Pure was the In first Austin. to do that. Yep. And then they made the acquisition of Portworks, which was pretty prescient, given that containers have been going through the roof. Yeah. So I'm sort of excited to have these guys on and talk about that. We're going to unpack all of this. We've got one of our alumni back with us, Venkat Ramakrishnan, VP of Product, Portworks by Pure Storage, and Dan Kogan joins us for the first time, VP of Product Management and Product Marketing, Flash Array at Pure Storage. Guys, welcome to the program. Thank hey you. Guys. Thanks for having Do us. Do you have a favorite steak restaurant in Vegas? There's, last Dave said, there's a lot of good choices. There's a lot of good steak restaurants. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, so, I like SDK. Yeah? That's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. A good one. Which one? I, SDK. SDK. Where's that? Uh, it's, I think, in, the, in Cosmopolitan. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 good. yeah. There's yeah. one at the Westin, too, that's pretty I'm an, good. I'm an Herbs and Rye guy. Have you ever been there? No. no. Herbs and Rye is off strip, uh, but it's fantastic. It's kind of like a, lo out. a local's joint. Have to dig through all of this great stuff today and then check that out. Talk to me, this is our first day, obviously, first main day. I want to get both of your perspectives. Dan, we'll start with you since you're closest to me. What are, how are you finding this year's event so far? Obviously, tons of people. Busy. Busy, yeah. yeah. It is, it is old times. Uh, yeah. It's a bit bigger, right? Last reInvent I was at was 2019, um, right before everything shut down, and it was probably half the size of this, which is a different trend than I feel like most other tech conferences have gone where they've come back, but a little bit smaller. Rein, reInvent seems to be the, the IT show. It really yeah. does. Ben, are you finding the same? Uh, uh, in terms of uh, what you're experiencing so far on day one of the event. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, this tremendous excitement. Overall, I think it's good to be back. Uh, very good crowd, great turnout. A lot of excitement around some of the new offerings uh, we've announced. Uh, the boot traffic has been pretty good. And uh, the just the quality of the conversations, the customer meetings uh, have been really good. There's very interesting use cases shaping up and customers really looking to solve you know, real, real large scale problems. Yeah, it's been a phenomenal first day. Then can I talk a little bit about, and then we'll get to you, sure. Dan, as well, the relationship that Portworks by Pure Storage has with AWS, maybe some joint customers? Yeah, so we definitely, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have been a partner of AWS for quite some time, right? The, uh, earlier this year, we signed what is called a strategic investment letter with AWS where you know, we kind of put some uh, uh, joint effort together like to better integrate our products, plus you know, kind of get in front of our customers more together and educate them on how they can deploy and build mission critical apps on you know, EKS and EKS Anywhere and Outpost. So that partnership has uh, grown a lot over the last year. We have a lot of uh, significant mutual customer wins together, both on, uh, on the public cloud on EKS as well as on EKS Anywhere, right? And there are some exciting use cases around edge and like you know edge deployments and you know uh, like different levels of edge and as well with the EKS anywhere. And uh, there, are, there, are, there are pretty good wins on the outpost as well. So that partnership I think is kind of like uh, growing across. Uh, not just we started out with the one product line. Yeah. Now our Portworks backup as a service is also available on EKS and uh, you know along with uh, Portworks data services. So it is also expanded across the product lines as well. And then, Dan, you want to elaborate a bit on AWS plus Pure? Yeah, it's for kind of, we'll call it the core Pure business or the traditional Pure business. Um, as Dave mentioned, Cloud Block Store is kind of where things started. And we're seeing that move and evolve from predominantly being a DR site and kind of story into now more and more production applications being lifted and shifted and running now natively in AWS um, on our storage software. And then uh, we have a new product called Pure Fusion which is our storage as code automation product essentially. It takes you from moving, in man moving and managing of individual arrays, now obfuscates at a fleet level, allows you to build a very cloud-like backend and consume storage as code, very, very similar to how you do with AWS, 
with an EBS, that product is built in AWS. So it's a SaaS product built in AWS, um, really allowing you to turn your traditional pure storage into an AWS-like experience. What, what changed with Cloud Block Store? Because if I recall, am I right that you basically did it on S3 originally? S3 is it, uh, a big, it's, it's a number of components. And you uh, had, a, you had a, a, you know, high performance EC2 instances. Yep, that's right on top of you know, lower cost object store. Is that still the case? That's, that's still the architecture. Yeah. yeah, at least for AWS. It's a different architecture in Azure where we leverage their disk storage more, but in AWS we're just based on essentially that back end. And then, and then what's the experience when you go from say on-prem to AWS to, to sort of across cloud? Is it Yeah, very, very simple. It's, just, it's our replication technology built in. So um, our sync rep, our async rep, our active Active cluster technology is essentially allowing you to move the data really, really seamlessly there. And then again, back to Fusion now being that kind of master control plane. You can have availability zones running cloud block store instances in AWS. You can be running your own availability zones in your data centers, wherever those may happen to be. And that's kind of a unification layer across it all. And it looks the same to the customer. To the customer, it looks that's the same. At the end of the day, it's what the customer sees is the purity operating system. Yeah. We have flash array proprietary hardware on premises. We have AWS's hardware that we run it on here, but to the customer, it's just the flash array. That's a data super cloud, actually. Yeah, it's a data super cloud. I would agree. It, it spans multiple clouds. Mm -hmm. Multiple clouds right? on premises. It abstracts the, all the complexity of the underlying muck and the primitives and presents a, a common experience. Yeah, and it's the same APIs, same management, console. Yeah, awesome. Everything's the same. Yeah, see, so. it's real, it's a thing. Um, on containers, I, I have a question. So, we're in this environment, everybody wants to be more efficient. What's happening with containers? Is there, the intersection of containers and serverless, right, and you think about all the things you have to do to, to run containers and VMs, you know, configure everything, configure the memory, choose, et cetera, and then serverless, you know, simplifies all that. I guess Knative in between, or I guess Fargate. What are you seeing with customers between stateless apps, stateful apps, and how it all relates to containers? Yeah. It's a great question, right? I think the, one of the things that what we are seeing is that uh, as people run more and more workloads in the cloud, right, there's this huge uh, movement towards being uh, the ability to bring these applications to run anywhere, right? Not just in one public cloud, but in the data centers and sometimes in the edge clouds. So there's a lot of uh, portability requirements for applications, right? I mean, just today morning I was having breakfast with a customer who is a big AWS customer, but has to go into uh, an on-prem air gap deployment for one of their large customers, and is kind of replatforming some of their apps into containers and Kubernetes, because it makes it so much easier for them to deploy. So there is, there is no longer the debate of, oh, is it stateless versus stateful? It's pretty much all applications are moving to containers, right? And in that, you see people are building on Kubernetes and containers is because they wanted multi-cloud uh, you know, uh, portability for the applications. Now, the other big uh, aspect is cost, right? You can significantly run, you know, like lower cost by running with Kubernetes and Portworx and by on the public cloud or on a private cloud, right? Because uh, you know, it lets you get more out of your infrastructure. You're not over-provisioning your infrastructure. You're like just deploying the just enough infrastructure for your application to run with Kubernetes and scale it dynamically as your application load scales. So customers are better able to manage costs. Right? Does serverless play in here though? Right, because, because if I'm running serverless, I'm not paying for the compute the whole time. Yeah. Right, but, but, but then stateless and state will come into play, so help serverless us Serverless has that. a place, but it is, it is more for like, you know, quick event-driven, uh, you know, decisions. Stateless that, apps. Yes, yeah. you know, stuff that needs to happen. Yeah. The serverless has a place, but uh, majority of the applications have need compute, and more, more compute to run because there's like, you know, a ton of processing you have to do, there is, you know, you're serving a whole bunch of users, you're serving up media, right? Those are not typically good uh, serverless apps, right? The serverless apps do definitely have a place. There's a whole bunch of, you know, minor code snippets or events you need to process every now, every now and then to make some decisions. In that, yeah, you see serverless. But majority of the apps are still, you know, requiring a lot of compute and scaling the compute and scaling storage requirements so all the time. So what Venka was talking about with cost, that is probably our biggest tailwind from a cloud adoption standpoint. I think initially for on-premises vendors like Pure Storage or historically on-premises vendors, 
the move to the cloud was a concern, right? And that we're getting out of the data center business, we're going all in on the cloud, what are you going to do? That's kind of why we got ahead of that with Cloud Block Store. But as customers have matured in their adoption of cloud and actually move more applications, they're becoming much more aware of the costs. And so anywhere you can set, help them save money seems to drive adoption. So they see that on the Kubernetes side. On our side, just by adding in things that we do really well, data reduction, thin provisioning, low cost snaps, those kind of things, massive cost savings. And so it's actually brought a lot of customers who thought they weren't going to be using you know, our storage moving forward back into the fold. Got it. What are some, so cost savings, great, huge business outcomes, potentially for customers, but what are some of the barriers that you're helping customers to overcome on the storage side, and also in terms of moving applications to Kubernetes? What are some of those barriers that Yeah, I mean, I can ask you, simply from a core flash array side, it's, it's enabling migration of applications without having to refactor them entirely, yeah. right? That's yeah. Kubernetes side is when they think about changing their applications and building them, we'll call quote unquote more cloud native, but there are a lot of customers that can't or won't or just aren't doing that. But, how, but they want to run those applications in the cloud. So the movement is easier, back to your data super cloud uh, kind of comment, and then also eliminating this high cost associated with it. I'm kind of not a huge fan of the whole repatriation narrative. You know, you look at the numbers and it's like, yeah, there's, there's some going on. But the one use case that looks like it, it's actually va valid is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test in the cloud yep. and I'm going to deploy on-prem. Now, I don't know if that's even called repatriation, nah. but 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 I'm looking for I'm looking to help the repatriation narrative, because uh, I think but, but 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 that that's a real thing. Yeah, right? it's more yeah. than repatriation, right? It's it's more about the ability to run your app, right? It's not just even test, right? I mean, like you're going to have different kinds of governance and compliance and regulatory requirements of to run your apps in, in different kinds of cloud environments, right? There are certain certain regions may not have uh, all of the uh, compliance and regulatory uh, requirements implemented in that cloud provider, right? So when you run with Kubernetes and containers, I mean, you kind of do the transformation, so now you can take that app and run in an, an infrastructure that allows you to deliver uh, with under those requirements as well, right? It, so that portability is the major driver than repatriation. And right? you would do that for, lo for latency reasons? For latency and, you know, like, yeah. Or data sovereignty. Data sovereignty, data sovereignty, data sovereignty control. right? I mean, yeah. Availability of your application and data just in that region, right? So okay, yeah. so if the capability's not there in the cloud region, you come in and say, hey, we can do that on-prem or in a colo and get you what you what you need to, to, to comply to your edicts. Yeah, or yeah. potentially moves to a different cloud provider, right? It's just a lot more control that you're providing the end customer at the end of the day. What's that move like? I mean, you're, now you're moving data and everybody's going to complain about egress fees. Well, you shouldn't be, but, I think it's more of a one-time move. Like, you're yeah. probably not going to be moving data between cloud providers regularly. But if for whatever reasons you decide that I'm going to stop running in X cloud and I'm going to move to this cloud, what's the most seamless way to do that? So a customer might say, okay, that certification is not going to be available in this region or Gov cloud or whatever for right. a year. I need this now. Yeah, or various Boom, commercials, whatever it might be. And I'm going to make the call now, one way door, and I'm going to keep it on prem. Or, you yeah. Know, yeah. And then worry about it down the road. Okay, makes sense. Dan, I got to talk to you about the sustainability element there because it's increasingly becoming a priority for organizations in yeah. every industry where they want, they need to work with companies that really have established sustainability programs. What are some of the, the factors that you talk with customers about as they have choice in all flash arrays between peer and competitors? Where Yeah, I mean, we've, we've leaned very heavily into that from a marketing standpoint recently because it has become so top of mind for so many customers, but at the end of the day, sustainability was built into the core of the purity operating system and flash array, back before it's flash array, right, in our early generation of products. Um, the things that drive that sustainability of high density, high data reduction, small footprint, we needed to build that for pure to exist as a company. And we're maybe kind of the last all flash vendor standing that came, that came ground up all flash, not just the disk vendor that's refactored, right? And so that sort of engineering from the ground up that's deeply, deeply into our software has a huge sustainability payout now. And we see that, and that message is really, really resonating with customers. I haven't thought about that in a while. You actually are. I don't we think are. there's yep. any other, nobody else made it through the knot hole. Yeah. And it's, you guys hit escape velocity and then We some. hit escape velocity and, it's, and it hasn't slowed down, right? I could, we, earnings will be tomorrow, but the last, the yeah, last no, we, many quarters have been pretty good. Yeah, we, so. we follow you pretty closely. Yeah. I mean, there was, 
one little thing in the in the pandemic, and then boom, it's just kept cranking since. So, so at the end of the day, though, right? Huh. We needed that level to be economically viable uh, as a flash vendor going against disk, yeah. and now that's really paying off in in a sustainability equation as well because we consume so much less footprint, power, cooling, all the all those factors. And there's been some headwinds with NAND pricing up until recently too that you've kind of blown right through. Yep. And it, I, you know, you dealt with the, the supply issues and... Yeah, because the, over, yeah. the overall, t it, one, we've been, again, one of the few vendors that's been able to navigate supply really well. Yeah. Uh, we've had no, no major delays and disruptions, but um, the TCO argument's real. Like at the end of the day, when you look at the cost of running on, on Pure, it's very, very compelling. It, 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 uh, Adam Slipsky made the statement, if you're looking to tighten your belt, the cloud is the place to do it. Yeah, okay, I buy that, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe not. But you can, so again, we are seeing cloud customers that, you know, traditional Pure data center customers that a few years ago said, we're moving these applications into the cloud. You know, it's been great working with you. Uh, we love Pure, we'll, we'll have some on-prem footprint, but most of everything we're going to do is in the cloud. Those customers are coming back to us to run and keep running in the cloud. Because again, when you start to act, factor in things like then provisioning, data reduction, those don't exist in the cloud. So, so, so it's not repatriation. It's not repatriation. It's we want pure in the cloud. Correct, we want your software, so that's why we yeah. built CBS. And we're seeing that come all the way through. Yep. Uh, so there's, another, there's another cost savings is on the, you know, with what we are doing with uh, Kubernetes and containers and, and Portrux data services, right? So we, when we run Portrux data services, typically where customers spend a lot of money in running the cloud managed services, right? Where, you know, there is a, there's obviously a sprawl of those, right? And then they end up spending a lot of hidden costs. So when we move that, you know, like when they run their data, like when they move their databases to Portrux data services on Kubernetes, you know, because of all of the, you know, all of the other cost savings we deliver, plus, you know, the licensing costs are a lot lower, you know, we deliver, you know, 5x to 10x savings to our customers. Significant. Uh, you know, significant savings yeah, on the, the cloud as well. Yeah, the operational yeah. things he's talking about too. We, my Fusion engineering team is one of his largest customers for Portworx Data Services because we don't have DBAs on that team, it's just developers. Yeah. But they need databases. They need yeah. to run those databases. Yeah. We turn to PDS. Cool. This so. is why he pays my bills. And that's why you guys have to come back because we're out of time. But I do have one <laughs> final question for sure. each of you. Same question. We'll start with you, Dan. Then Ben Kent will go to you. Billboard. Billboard or a bumper sticker? Say, we'll say, put a, they're going to put a billboard on Castor Street in Mountain View, near the headquarters, about Pure. What does it say? Um, the best container for containers. <laughs> <laughs> ben Cap, Port Works, what's your bumper sticker? Well, um, I would just have uh, one like big billboard that goes and says, got PX with a question mark, right? and let people start thinking about what is BX. <laughs> I love that. Gut Fort Works, you, You've got a side career in marketing, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> I think see? they moved him out of its engineering. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Well, we really appreciate you joining us on the program this afternoon talking about Pure, Fort Works, AWS, really compelling stories about how you're helping customers just really make big decisions and save considerable cost. We appreciate your insights. Awesome, great, thanks for All having right. us. Thanks guys. Thank you. For Good our guests here. and for Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live enterprise and emerging tech coverage.